Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And as, as I indicated over the last six months or so, I'm, I'm leading off, if you will, uh, with my cover, as you can see. Uh, the fact of the matter is um, I'm just, again, making the point to veterans, families of veterans and the like, you know, get to the VA, get them involved. The bottom line is that uh, many of them are sick, many of them are in need of services and whatever, but in most cases, many of them do not go and, and actually participate in that application process of signing up. So uh, do do that, please, especially those family members, because now they're getting of age, especially those in the Vietnam War, in the, the Vietnam War and, and uh, naturally the Iraqi War in those areas. Uh, these are young people that have lost their families and, and a number of jobs and a whole bunch of other things. But there are services that are available for vets, but the idea is just to get them over there. And then again, I'd, I'd, I'd be, I'm still concerned about those individuals that are standing on the corner claiming to be vets. In all due respect, they're not vets. If you, if you feel that they are, put them in your car and take them down to the, to the VA, whether it be in Vancouver, Washington, or down in the main one here in the Portland metropolitan area. And if you have a problem with that, you can give me a call at 503-701-0457. I'd be more than glad to pick them up. Okay, but you get them, and I'll, you call me, and I'll meet you. Fair. Okay, with that, let's get on with the show. Well, today, I've got a gentleman here that uh, I've known for a number of years, and and uh, the highlighted point of our relationship is, is that um, he was the only sole attorney that I, I found in, the, in fact in these United States that would have been willing, that was willing, if you will, to represent the custodians here in the Portland metropolitan area. I don't know if you're familiar with that. For those of you who've been around, uh, the custodians here were or uh, in the Portland Public School uh, uh, during that particular time. Uh, they were, in fact, they were the largest employer of African Americans in the Portland Public School, the custodians, and they were fired. And it's kind of interesting, they were fired uh, and, and, and the, um, they were replaced by the SEIU folks, SEIU, in most cases Hispanics. And, uh, and many of those folks were, were getting ready to get their purge and retire and this, that, and the other. And it was, it was crazy. I think it was about two, maybe three years or so that we, we fought that particular issue. And I'm talking about Jim Lewenberg. I want to really, I, may, I want to make it, I want to make it right up front personal uh, for those custodians and also for the city of Portland and the right thing to do uh, to give, uh, to give Jim uh, kudos and credit for staying there with us and staying with those custodians to the end, the very end. And all due respect, at the end of the day, uh, that some of the jobs were reinstated. They were being brought back. Unfortunately, some of the, those individuals died, if you will. Several of them died. They took their lives up because their whole livelihood was taken away from them. So, uh, but here's the guy that was there for us, uh, for the custodians and for the right thing for that matter. Well, as you know, uh, this is Jim Lewenberger, and Jim has run for office before, by the way, uh, somewhat comparable to some of the things that I've been doing. But if, again, for the right thing. Too often, sometimes if, it's, it, make it, if it makes too much sense, for some strange reason, one doesn't identify, if you will, as a serious candidate. You know, I'm not, I think about that, about the serious media, if you will. And in most cases, I, I, I understand now what that's all about. I'm sure Jim does also, too. They don't have the background. And media is kind of like, uh, during that particular time, doing politics, media is like a bonanza. I mean, you know, the, it's the bottom line at that point in time. So it's kind of like the, the old golden rule. He who has the gold rule, or he who has the money rule, and so therefore, uh, sometimes it, it, it takes away from people who are, we are in need, if you will, of representing this great state of ours, the great state of Oregon. Well, with that, I've said enough, Jim. How you doing? Very good. Yeah, you're looking great. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Sounds good. Hey, by the way, just on, on a quick note, let, let's, let's reflect a little bit about that custodial piece, Jeff, for, for a moment. Would you mm -hmm. mind? No, not at all. Yeah, it was uh, uh, you know, shocking uh, mismanagement by the or Portland Public Schools. It absolutely made no sense to me whatsoever because the, the, the Portland Public Schools custodians were specifically protected by a state statute that said they couldn't be fired for no cause. They, if, if they'd done something wrong, they could be terminated, but there was a process to go through. Well, the Portland Public Schools decided they didn't want to go through that process. They just want to you know, throw them all away mm -hmm. and then bring in uh, uh, people that were going to be paid a lot less money than the custodians were, people with less qualifications. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, they did that. And then the, the second shock, well, you know, first it started off with the Portland Public Schools thinking they could do that. And then a number of judges said that that was okay. Hmm. And uh, finally it got to the Oregon Supreme Court, and the Oregon Supreme Court said, no, the, the statute says what it says, and you have a process to use. You can't use what uh, you've done here. You, you've got you to use the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, in the court, that took years. It took years. And I, I wasn't the only attorney. There, the, the union hired an attorney and or several attorneys, and they did a, they did a good job. Uh, but I lended moral support and some legal support to a, a few dissident group that did not want to participate in the, the way the union was handling things. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason they were upset with the way the, the union was handling things was, as you mentioned, SEIU uh, was representing the replacements but the SEIU was supposed to have been representing the custodians who were let go in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> they were member dues paying members. That's right. And, the, and the, the dissidents that I represented were the ones that were particularly upset at SEIU for stabbing them in the back. Mm -hmm. And they tried. They went to SEIU National. They tried to, to make their case. Hey, wait, you shouldn't be stabbing us in the back. You know, we're good dues paying members. You should be protecting us. And uh, they were ignored. And uh, un until the Oregon Supreme Court finally said the statute meant what it said. Mm -hmm. I might add, too, that uh, there were two other important figures in, within that whole arena, besides other custodians that were with us, but Don Strong. I mean, Don Strong mm -hmm. really participated. Uh, in fact, he monetarily did that, and, and he just stood right out there as a point person for custodians across the board, for that yes, matter. Yes, Across the board. And then there was Chad Dednam. Chad Dednam, who was who was, had to have been chairman of the board, right? And there was a board... That, that uh, basically was representing this, the, the the membership, if you will, right. in the school. At the same well, there was there was a special board created, pursuant to state statute, right. to to handle grievances of because you know to you handle the ter to handle discipline of custodians and grievances of mm -hmm. custodians. That was part of the public Portland public schools. Right. Uh, it was set up by by because the statute said they had to have that right. board, and so. That, that guy was very important, too, yeah, because he said, hey, wait a minute, you, you can't do, mm -hmm. you Portland Public Schools can't do this to these custodians. And he was a volunteer. Mm -hmm. that was, he was, That's a, right. He was a volunteer. And again, like I said, Don Strong, again, too, was a custodian. He had, and, and, and he spent quite a bit of his money, if you will, his retirement funds, uh, representing, in many ways, representing the custodians. So, uh, but anyway, that, that was pretty tough. And, and um, uh, but I, want you, I just want you to realize that uh, this was, that was huge and the kind of a person that Jim Lewinberger has been and always has been, as long as I've known him, always for the right thing. Well, Jim, you're running for office again. I am. Okay. I'm running for U.S. Senate. Okay. Uh, it, it, and it wasn't something I looked forward to. I mean, I, I, I have never wanted to be a U.S. Senator. I, I don't particularly want to be a U.S. Senator now. It would mean I'd have to move to Washington, D.C., for one thing. And I like Oregon. I love Oregon. I don't really want to move. So, but the chances of my winning election are, are very slim. But the reason, the, the primary reason I decided to put my, uh, allow my name to be put on the ballot by the Constitution Party of Oregon was uh, if the Republicans, uh, let's put it this way, if anybody had run or was on the ballot who was pro life, I wouldn't have put my name on the, on the wouldn't have let my name be put on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But I think that everybody should be allowed to be born, mm -hmm. <laughs> the unborn should be allowed to live. And, and uh, no human being should be able to say that the unborn are uh, unworthy of life. And therefore, I am the only uh, candidate. Are you sure? The only one. I'm the only candidate on the ballot uh, for U.S. Senate who is pro-life. I firmly believe that a person should be allowed to be born and to have life. Uh, there are a lot of other issues involved beyond that. It's, it's, um, it's basically a, a lifetime thing. Is You should be allowed to be born and uh, you shouldn't have your life taken away from you when you're when you're uh, uh, ill or old, uh, and uh, the, I, you know, the the concept of, of death panels, which mm -hmm. I firmly believe are mm -hmm. part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the government shouldn't be telling people uh, that they're no longer you know worth living and that they they should uh, just go away and die. Uh, and by the same token, the government should not allow anybody, whether it be a doctor or a mother, to kill the unborn. Uh, there is there's no excuse for that. I believe that both the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution and the Fourteenth Amendment, which say that uh, life cannot be taken away without due process of law, protects the unborn. Uh, there is an issue as to whether or not the unborn are human beings or persons or not. But if they're not persons, 
what are they? Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the propaganda used by uh, uh, people like um, uh, Planned Parenthood is that they 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 want to change the language. They don't call them they don't want to call them babies. They want to call them fetuses or uh, unviable mm -hmm. tissue masses. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they're not. They're persons. Uh, one can debate when, when a person becomes a person, is it at conception or uh, when they start breathing, but uh, as far as I can tell, uh, from a scientific standpoint, the DNA becomes unique when, when conception, conception occurs. Mm -hmm. DNA is what makes us a human being or person, and therefore, uh, from conception on, a person is a person and should be protected by the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and by, you know, by by people, we should be protecting the most vulnerable, and the unborn are the, are, are our most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, from a historical standpoint, um, and talk a little bit about that. Sort of like when did that when did that, that that whole that deal started up, if you will, if you can give us a little background on it. I, I, I mean, in fact, better better yet, from an Oregon standpoint, Bill Diaz. You're very familiar with well, Bill. I've had the good fortune of getting to know Bill Diss, who who used to be a teacher at uh, Benson Polytechnic. Portland Public Schools. Yes, he was a a, a, a good, strong teacher. Uh, he hadn't started out. He, he actually worked in, in industry. Uh, he, uh, he he had a, a science and, and uh, uh, engineering background, mm -hmm. and uh, he came to the Portland Public Schools to teach kids, you know how how life works in terms of getting a job and and uh, using mechanical and, and mathematical skills and computer skills to uh, further, you know, better oneself. Uh, but in, but a, what he did on the side was he brought uh, the, um, uh, the, the fact that Planned Parenthood at that point wanted to build a clinic on Martin Luther King, yes, yes. Uh, and he fought that, the building of it, and then once it was built, he fought the use of it, uh, you know, the, that it would... And one of the things that he, he brought out, and I think he's absolutely accurate about it, was that by planting or putting that building on Martin Luther King Boulevard, Planned Parenthood was saying, we want the black babies to be killed. We, we think there are too many black babies being born, and we want, to, we want to market our services to black mothers so that they won't burden society with too many black babies. That's absolutely reprehensible, but it's consistent with the teachings of the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. She didn't think, uh, there, she thought there were far more two black people uh, in the United States then mm -hmm. and uh, the world. Uh, it, it's a racist based, race, anti black, race based organization, always has been. And the, by, by putting their clinic on Martin Luther King, that was the, a strong message that we want they, the Planned Parenthood, think there are too many black babies being born. We don't want so many black babies being born. Mm -hmm. So I say he was an, he was a zealous advocate to 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 stop the build, building the clinic, and then to uh, bring community pressure on Planned Parenthood to not continue to murder babies. And Planned Parent Planned Parenthood is a is a vicious enemy, and they fight they don't fight fair. So what they did was they worked hand in glove with the administration mm -hmm. of Portland Public Schools to make his life uh, miserable at, mm -hmm. uh, on campus. One of the things that they did uh, was that they, uh, he, was, he was operating some study halls, and, and they, made, uh, they put this program in where Planned Parenthood was going to teach kids about you know, choices about health. Hmm. Uh, and, they, and they made him, uh, 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 his, they made, basically forced him to have his children, his, his students, go to that uh, that group, and uh, he was adamantly opposed to it. As soon as he found out it was connected to Planned Parenthood, he did everything he could uh, to stop it, and then he, was, he basically ultimately got fired because he was so opposed to uh, uh, them doing that to his students, mm -hmm. and he didn't want it, you know, to go forward. I, I, I was I sat with him during a number of disciplinary proceedings that they they instituted in the principal's office, and um, boy, I'll tell you the, the hatred. Uh, hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it's a. It, most when you when you're dealing with a person who hates you, mm -hmm. or hates a friend, it, it, it's not so much the words they use. I mean, they were very very well trained on to use the right words, but the visual, you know, the, the looks on their faces and the tones of their voices, they hated Bill Diss hmm. because he wanted to protect babies, and um, uh, they they got their way. He he's been terminated now. 
He's hired a different attorney who knows more about labor law than I do to try and get uh, either get reinstated or to get uh, compensated for being wrongfully terminated. And I, and I hope he succeeds in that because uh, I think they went after him because he's a Christian. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's really interesting how, how we've gotten to a point that we're, we're anti-life. I mean, to, at, at, during the 20th century, at this point in time, we're anti-life. Yes. That's, uh, I mean, that's quite a statement to be made at this point in time. Well, it is. I've got mine. So I've got mine, you know, you know, that kind of a deal. You've got to get your own. But, you know, that's a, that's a really false uh, yeah. uh, position to take because you may have yours now right. when you are articulate and healthy and, and uh, you've got some money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, but eventually, those things go away. Mm -hmm. Everybody becomes sick and everybody dies. And uh, uh, I'm nervous. Uh, I'm I'm only 57 years old, so it could well. If if our society continues to go down the path it's going down, at some point, I, the the you know, well probably the government is going to say, you've you've lived long enough, Lewinberger. It's time for you to uh, check out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we're we we're doing. You know, you, you mentioned the Veterans Administration yep, and exactly. the way yeah. that the Veterans Administration is treating veterans. Oh, very much so. It's shocking. It, it's, uh, it, it's sickening. We made promises to all those veterans. We were going to protect them. We were going to provide them with, with uh, good quality health care for the remainder of their lives, mm -hmm. whether they had service-related injuries or not. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, they, they were going to be protected by the Veterans Administration. That was mm -hmm. part of the promise in exchange for them serving their country oftentimes putting their lives at, at, at mm -hmm. great danger. And many of them, were, of course, were injured in the course of their service for their country. Yep. And now when it's time for them to, to get the services they need, we're, we're putting up all sorts of impediments and, and uh, making it harder and harder for them to get the care they need. Unfortunately, this is a longstanding problem. It's not Barack Obama's fault. No, no, it's, 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 this has been going on for a very, 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 long, very time. long time. My father uh, was a veteran, and... And uh, he had a heart valve replacement. And they put him on. He put on Coumadin through a health, or private health insurance. And then he wanted to save money, so he went to the VA to get uh, his Coumadin. And uh, they gave him too much, and he started bleeding internally, and he never, really, never recovered from that. Um, so, I, and I think everybody that has knows people who've been served by the VA can tell similar stories. Uh, um, and, and they're not new. I mean, we've not been taking care of our veterans the way we should. And, 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 and unfortunately, uh, it also happens for active uh, duty military. Yeah. They're yeah. not getting the services they need from the health care providers in the, in the military. Well, one of the observations I will, I've made uh, when I was in the service is that we had more military folks that were actually administering, if you will, medical uh, during my particular time. And there was a sense of they recognized the same situation that they were in. So we had a far better response, if you will, to the, e to the needs. Mm -hmm. Under today's criteria, you, you have more civilian-oriented kind of, a, as you know, the, the, the uproar about folks getting their benefits and getting bonuses and things of that nature. And, and their, their interest is not the vet. Many, right. many of them, is not, it's not the interest of the, the vet. It's just the, 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 the almighty dollar, in all due respect. I hate to put it that way. But that's a fact. That's a fact. And that, that's something that I would hope that the administration would, would go back and look at that situation at the table and say, look, let's get the vets back. Let's get the military back to the table, if you will. Because uh, even in, in overseas, the Iraqi war, and this, that, it was just a whole total civilian kind of situation. It, co this, it cost this economy, I mean, a great deal of dollars, if you will. Well, that's been, it has been fascinating. It's changed. It has changed. And, um, uh, of course, it, uh, it, it's it's absolutely fascinating the the history of the military and and uh, because I, I I read and love the U.S. Constitution. One of the interesting things about the Constitution is uh, it says that the Congress can have a navy, and then it says the Congress can also provide for an army, but it can only have the the budget can only be for two years at a time. Hmm. The thing is, and, and we look at the Second Amendment, it talks about the need we need to have a, a militia. And therefore, the right to keep their arms shall not be infringed. The the founders of the, this country were very nervous about a full time standing army. Mm. Uh, they felt that it was necessary to have a full time standing navy because it takes a long time to build warships and, and there's a lot of technical training involved with keeping the staffing up. 
but they were concerned that the army would be used to oppress the people. And that's why they wanted the militia to be the primary, uh, 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 that is, the, the every common everyday man, men, mm -hmm, were to be mm -hmm. uh, our, our, provide the military. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, so it, it, it's been fascinating because people like um, uh, professional military people like say Dwight Eisenhower uh, or, or Washington, uh, George Washington himself, they were always reluctant to rely upon the, mil the militia because uh, they didn't have the training that uh, the mm -hmm. regular army pe people had. So there's always there's been a constant battle back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, militia uh, standing army. Since World War II, the, the, the emphasis has been strongly on a standing army, but when uh, we had the vir virtually universal uh, draft uh, mm -hmm. during the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, that basically chased uh, Johnson out of office. Mm -hmm. It was so unpopular, uh, you know, the, the white middle class people didn't want to uh, fight and die for their country. They didn't want to go. That's right. Right. That's right. And so, you know, Nixon instituted the voluntary army, and uh, we've never gone back to a, a draft. I don't know that we, we will, but one of the, the, the uh, side effects of that is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, middle class, upper middle class people uh, generally don't go into the military. That's right. That's right. And uh, there's, I guess there's positives and negatives. I also believe that uh, uh, the draft is, is very close to slavery, imposing slavery, so I'm not sure that... Well, it was a melting pot, though. I mean, It, it was it, definitely it was a melting a, pot. It was a melting pot for everybody. Yeah. And many of the poor actually ended up basically going into the military. Right, right. But but even people, you know, successful people like Elvis Presley were, were uh, drafted into the military yeah, in the yeah. 50s. And uh, uh, it was a very different institution then than it, it, or, it, then than it is now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I say, now it, it's all volunteers. Uh, and they've been extraordinarily successful in terms of when we, when we fight a war, we do very, very well. Uh, well, we're in the drone age now, see. Well, that is interesting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. And then you have to be pretty well technically, uh, technically, uh, let's see, doable, if you will, having that sort of experience. I mean, it's, it's a pretty tough situation to get in mm -hmm. that kind of arena. These are specialty kind of fields. Yep. And then on the other hand, we, we're just now we are, we're just housing folks in, the, in our criminal justice system. I mean, many of those you know, individuals could have been actually military guys, could have actually gone in because everybody has a job. Everybody has a job. And then, so consequently, when they got out, they could have picked up another job. Well, that it, was, that was quite it used to be very common for a person accused of a minor crime yeah. to be given an alternative. You go to jail or you go to the military. And uh, many chose the military. Uh, I represented a young man years ago uh, who, who made it. He was involved in vandalizing some property, and mm -hmm. that was a, I got that worked out so that he could choose the army or, or the jail, and he chose the army, mm -hmm. and it worked out real well for him in terms of not doing jail. Uh, he saw combat. Uh, he came back home. Uh, he uh, discovered alcohol. Uh, yeah. He hasn't really yeah. recovered from yeah. it. Yeah. Combat is is a uh, is a shock to the system. Yeah. Not yeah. that I need to tell you, oh, yeah, but you know. As I say, you know, I mentioned minutes ago that the military is extraordinarily successful when we fight, when we decide to fight a war. But I tell you, one of the things that's been frustrating is uh, we don't know, seem to know how to end wars anymore. Uh, in World War II, for instance, uh, we decided we were, we were going to require unconditional surrender from Germany and Japan, and and we didn't stop until uh, we got unconditional surrenders from both countries. Our involvement started in, in December 1941 and, and finished in August of 1945. So it was less than four years. Mm -hmm. And there was a tremendous mobilization of the entire economy was turned to, to creating things for war. And then the men were trained and sent over to the Pacific and, and, and Europe. And in four, less than four years, uh, we, 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 we defeated these two very strong nations. Right. Right. Then Korea... Uh, Things kind of went cattywampus. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 North Koreans attacked South Korea. We went to fight, but then we got into this basically this stalemate for for years. Politics, exactly. And and you know that the whole thing is one can well wonder. Well, should we have used the atomic bomb then or not? Mm -hmm. uh, if we wanted to win the war, we would have used the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, Douglas MacArthur advocated for he it, did. and we didn't do that. Uh, and then Vietnam, of course, was another uh, yeah. quagmire. Mm -hmm. And one of the, thing, the saddest things about that was that 
we made, with congressional authority or for approval, we made a lot of promises to the South Vietnamese government mm -hmm. that we would pr help them if the, the, the North Vietnamese, uh, you know, attacked. And when time came for us to uh, help them, we didn't. Politics. Terrible. It wasn't a military decision, because we do as we're told. Exactly. Yeah? Yes. Wow, Jim. That's heavy. It's good history. Good deal. Now, let's go. Let's, let's come back to Oregon, because you are running for office. Yes. Now. Let's come back to Oregon. Running for office. What are some of the issues? What are some of the main issues that you feel uh, are in need, if you will, of get, gaining attention from someone representing us in Congress? Well, uh, there are a number. Uh, I think <clears throat> we've got far, far too many federal laws. Uh, far, far too well. Far too many federal laws. Period. And far, far too many criminal laws. Federal criminal laws. Uh, the federal government has said that things like marijuana, uh, cocaine, uh, heroin are illegal, and you, you cannot possess them. And it's gotten much worse than that. That's, that they did that a long time ago. That back. That's from the 19 teens and 20s. But now, because uh, basically the federal government is paranoid about what medical doctors do. You can, a medical doctor, just becoming, getting a, a, a diploma and then getting a license from a state is not good enough. That doesn't authorize you to prescribe controlled substances. Now, in order to, for a medical doctor licensed by the state of Oregon to, to prescribe a controlled substance, that person has to get a DEA uh, license to do that. In other words, the federal government has, is, is, you know, ju jumped into something that has always been a uh, matter of either state law or private negotiation between doctor and patient, which is interesting because, you know, on the other hand, Roe versus Wade was supposedly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, government shouldn't be inter getting in between doctor and patient. That was mm -hmm. the whole. That was the the fundamental reason That's what it was. why Roe versus Wade and and the U.S. Supreme Court said that abortion had to be legal. But on the, for everything else, the, the federal government has pushed itself, pushed itself in between the patient and the and the and the uh, doctor, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I don't think the federal government has any business whatsoever telling people what they can and cannot put in their bodies. You know, it's interesting when when Congress got it in its, its mind that they they wanted to make alcohol illegal, they passed a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal. That didn't work out so well. So then they passed another amendment to say that they were repealing the first one, the, the one that made alcohol illegal. Now, here's my thinking. If we needed a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal, why don't we need a constitutional amendment to make drugs illegal? Hmm. I think we do, and we've never done that, and I think, therefore, that all the federal laws that supposedly make uh, uh, drug possession or use or sale illegal are unconstitutional and should be stricken. Similarly, the Second Amendment I mentioned earlier says that the, uh, the, the government shall not infringe upon the right to keep and bear arms. We have lots and lots of laws infringing upon the right to keep and bear arms. Hmm. Uh, if you're a felon, you can't have a firearm. If you're a crazy person, you can't have a firearm. If you're, if you're dishonorably discharged from the military, you can't have a firearm. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Felons, crazy people, and, and dishonorably con uh, uh, discharged people all need the right, or all need to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And why does the government think it's, it's appropriate to, to take away the most effective way of defending oneself just mm -hmm. because of a person's status? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any legitimate reason for that. I think it's all unconstitutional. Um, now, that isn't to say that the, the Congress or the state of Oregon, say, can't make it, uh, a, make it a more serious crime for a person to use a firearm in the commission of a crime. That's entirely appropriate, but it, I don't think there's any legitimate grounds for making uh, possession of a firearm uh, or lawful use of a firearm by a, a felon, a crazy person, or a dishonorably discharged person. Uh, that's that doesn't make any sense to me. Tell you what, we're going to take a short break, and I want to come back and let's continue this discussion because I know you, you you did represent someone. I think it was a, a teacher or something like that. So, I did. Okay, we're going to come back and we'll we'll, we'll further that situation on. Okay. Hey, look, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Mr. Lohenberger. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Well, welcome back again to the segment of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, uh, your host, and I'm interviewing a candidate um, from the Constitutional Party running for Senate, J Jim Lewinberger, okay? And uh, for those of you who missed the first part of the show, I think it was very interesting that uh, I think you, you take some time and get the repeat, if you will. And as you know, um, we're also on YouTube. And you might want to share this with um, with some of your other members and the like. Okay, Jim, welcome back. Yes. Okay, good. You know, we sort of ended up talking about the whole. That is an issue. It's it's a major issue. It's a it's a national issue, but but from Oregon's standpoint, you know, we saw thinking about gun control and just, just bearing arms and this that, and, you know, having arms and this that and the other. That's that's a major piece. Where are we today on this issue? Well, the uh, the state law has tr has been tracking federal law. Okay. Um, uh, but it, it used to be. For instance, when a person was released from prison, person was given, you know, if, if when that person was arrested, he, he had a firearm, they gave him his firearm back. Uh, that's we haven't had that for a long time, but uh, uh, but that was fact. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, you see, you see some of the uh, not that not that Western movies are always accurate, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you'll see that in some of the Western movies from the fifties and sixties. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but we we have. Uh, well, what I call armament, dis, uh, excuse me, victim disarmament zones. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, schools, uh, it, it's, there's both uh, federal and state laws that say it is a crime to possess a firearm within a thousand feet of a school unless you have a concealed handgun license. Uh, now, this came up, as you mentioned, uh, I, had a, I represented a, a right. teacher in Medford who had gotten a divorce and got a restraining order against her husband. She was afraid of her husband. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the Medford School District had a policy prohibiting any of its staff and uh, teachers from having a firearm on campus, even if that person uh, had a concealed handgun license. And so we took that to court, and uh, ultimately we lost. Uh, we went to the Oregon Court of Appeals. And what, what they ruled was that a policy is not a law. There, there's, a, there's a state statute that prohibits local governments from uh, imposing greater restrictions on certain types of firearms uh, possession than state law. Now, of course, that's been an ongoing thing recently here because Portland and uh, Multnomah County have been uh, uh, having local ordinances that are more restrictive than state law. And unfortunately, the, uh, the appellate courts in Oregon have been approving these restrictions uh, of uh, ordinances restricting firearms rights. For instance, in Portland, it's illegal to have a loaded firearm in a public place, and they include a public place including your car. Hmm. Uh, so if you were to, unless you have a concealed handgun license, if you were to drive from your home to the studio and you had a, a loaded firearm even in the trunk of your car, mm -hmm. you'd be violating a Portland ordinance, and you could go to jail for that. Hmm. And Multnomah County has been trying to do the same, or has been doing the same thing for the unincorporated, well, they were trying to argue that it was for the incorporated parts of the state or the county, and they kind of backed off of that, at least temporarily. But, but for the unincorporated parts of Multnomah County, the county has a similar ordinance. And, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, as I say, I, I, we have we, Oregon Constitution, in, di in addition to the Second Amendment the, uh, from the U.S. Constitution, the Oregon Constitution has its own constitutional provision saying that we have the right to keep and bear arms. And uh, uh, there was a time 30, 40 years ago, where the Oregon Supreme Court was was a leader in, amongst the states in in recognizing the rights to keep and bear arms, mm -hmm. they it was I think it's the only state that said it's it's legal to have a uh, for an Oregonian to have a switchblade, because of the Oregon constitutional provision. A few years back, they were given an opportunity to rule on whether or not the statute saying that a felon cannot lawfully possess a firearm, mm -hmm. and they said this is one of the uh, shocking opinion to me. They said, yes, we, we recognize that although the Oregon Constitution does differentiate between felons and non-felons, and it didn't differentiate as to the right to keep and bear arms, hmm. nonetheless, we believe that it's within the, con or within the uh, legislature's authority to make it illegal for a felon to have a firearm. Hmm. Well, I, it never made any sense to me. It yeah. doesn't make any sense to me now. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. so. Look, another area that, um, that is a major concern, and it's always a major concern when the legislature is in session, is the whole issue of education. 
in terms of funding education and whatever. But most, in most cases, though, the majority of the population is still concerned with the bottom line, that is the education of my child mm -hmm. and the kind of education and, and the competitiveness of education and being able to, at the end of the day, they're going to be able to get a job or be able to go to school. You know, at, the idea, at the end of the day, if you get through, it's the whole idea of going to school to get a job and be, right. a, and be a citizen. Where, where, where are we on that issue in Oregon? Oh boy! More specifically, Portland. I know it's, it's huge, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Portland metropolitan area, but but across the state, well, education is key. It it is, and, and it's a it's a it's a hot topic these days. Mm -hmm. uh, Common Core has been you know shoved down the throats of Oregonians here recently, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it basically a, a nationwide uh, protocol of t testing is is the, the the big thing about Common Core, but using national standards. And, uh, uh, and, and frankly, standards that, that most people, when they learn about them, aren't terribly happy about. They're being imposed by people that want to uh, liberalize. And, and they don't, one of the things that is being written out of history books is U.S. history, for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read a currently... Written out. Yes, written out. Like, if you want to learn about George Washington, don't, don't go to a grade school, a junior high or a high school in Oregon. He's being written out of the uh, history books. Abraham Lincoln's being written out of the history books. Yeah. It's what's being written into the history books is how white people oppress Indians, how white people oppress blacks, how mm. you mm. know mm. the evil of, of uh, mm. th our history. Uh, who's, who's leading that charge? Well, uh, well, the, the yeah. short version is the Communist Party uh, mm -hmm. or people with communist sympathies, mm -hmm. and we have lots and lots of those people in academia. Mm. Uh, they're 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 writing the textbooks, and and they hate our country. Um, you know, when that whole issue came out with Common Core, my my first thought was, what happened to Common Voc Ed? Well, uh, now one of the things that, in an effort to save money, I think a lot of school districts have tried to write out of, of the curriculum things like uh, 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 shop. Yeah, what and, shop? Uh, Cooking, cooking, you know things that practical, kind of stuff. Yeah. practical stuff. Medicine. And the the fact of the matter is that uh, a, a person would do far better off now, from an economic standpoint, learning how to be a plumber, learning how to be an yeah. electrician, oh, yeah. even learning how to be a, a carpenter, yes. than trying to go after a college degree. For there, college is not the panacea. It is it is not the way for everybody to make to make a good living. Um, you know, college. One of the reasons college used to be a, a thing that upper class people, upper middle class people went yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you certainly don't need to go to college in order to uh, be a productive member of, uh, yeah, of exactly, society. Exactly. We need more people who are willing to uh, get their hands dirty and to do the the, the real life things that need to be done. We're going to have a shortage of plumbers, electricians, carpenters uh, if we continue to. Uh, act as if that isn't important, which we've been doing for a very, very long time. I would love to see more vocational yeah. education in, in Oregon, but of course that's not likely to be something that the U.S. Senate is, is terribly. Uh, uh, but as a as a Oregon voter and as a parent, uh, I would. Uh, in fact, I've encouraged my my oldest son. Uh, he wanted to be an M.D. and maybe he still does, but uh, he's now he's working on getting a medical technician uh, certificate. And he, he's thinking about becoming an RN, mm -hmm. and I fully support him in that. I, I what I don't want my child children to do is to go deeply into debt, mm -hmm. uh, pursuing mm -hmm. uh, diplomas That's or uh, degrees that aren't going to be of any value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, another area. Let's do that. What about this marijuana thing? I mean, you know, now all of a sudden we got the border state here in Washington. Now basically, they've improved their. They've, they've endorsed the whole issue of marijuana. You've got Denver now and, and Washington. And now Oregon is looking at it on the ballot. It's on yep. the ballot. Yep. What do you think about it? It should think, be on the ballot? Yeah, absolutely. You know, okay. It should pass. Uh, I'll vote for it. I voted for it the last time. I'll vote for it again. Uh, it's not perfect. the way Because what we're going to do is we're going to emulate Washington. And what Washington has done is basically said that the Liquor Control Commission is also going to be the Marijuana Control Commission. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather that... Uh, Marijuana just be legal, and if you want to grow marijuana, or you want to sell marijuana, that's your business. Don't don't run it through the school. Don't run it through state state uh, uh, stores. But I'd rather have it be legal run through state stores than uh, illegal. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I don't think that any of the federal laws uh, uh, on marijuana or heroin or cocaine are, are constitutional. Similarly, Oregon also has a constitution, 
And when Oregon decided they wanted to make alcohol illegal, they passed a, a actually passed two amendments to the Oregon Constitution to so that the people could make uh, alcohol illegal. Hmm. So if we had to do it for alcohol, why don't we have to do it for uh, the control, what we call the controlled substances, mm -hmm. marijuana, heroin, cocaine? Uh, again, the, the state of Oregon has no business uh, telling everybody that they cannot possess fire or cannot possess uh, drugs. Hmm. But the state, but the state possess uh, alcohol. Well, you no, know, we control it. We control the yeah, alcohol. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, it, we, but but there was a there around the same time that the U.S. government passed the, uh, I think it was the 17th Amendment, uh, Oregon passed two amendments to the Oregon Constitution mm -hmm. to make uh, alcohol illegal. Hmm. So wh what do you think? Okay, we, we've got that point. Now I'm thinking about, um, everyone's talking about getting in the business. I mean, I, I noticed that um, uh, Congressman Blumenauer was kind of like the leading factor talking about taxing and, and monies and things of that nature. But what about the other end, in terms of those folks that are that were incarcerated behind it? There's a lot of folks that are sitting in the institution that have been incarcerated just behind maybe just uh, selling pot or, or using pot or mm -hmm. this kind of a deal. What do we do about it? What, what about those folks? Can we, can we do anything about transitioning of some sort, getting them involved in the process? Well, it, it, in my humble opinion, they should all be granted amnesty. And amnesty says you didn't commit a crime. Uh, uh, but you know, that's a matter of that's up to the governor, governor or the president. The president can can uh, uh, do it for federal crimes, and, this, and the governor can do it for state crimes. Mm -hmm. And we've got lots and lots of people in prison for marijuana that don't belong there. Never, never should have gone there in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a starting place. Because again, I, I don't think we should be in the uh, in the business of telling other people what what to put in or not put in their bodies. So I think all the laws for all the drugs should be eliminated, and everybody who's been convicted of violating them should all be uh, receive amnesty and, and get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, well, then, we, we, then there's the unemployment rate that we have here in Oregon in terms of how do we, how do we deal with that issue also, too. We still have a high unemployment rate. Is we do. Understanding. And many of those folks didn't commit crimes. And then, but on the other hand, you've got these other folks that are going to be getting out. They can't find jobs or whatever. So it's a recidivism kind of a problem. They get right back in the same issues or the same problems. Well, this time it's not going to be about the drugs. But, be, but maybe they might be doing some other things, cases in the other joints, or this, that, and the other. But the thing is, just an idea, just an idea. If, in fact, we're going to be getting in this business aspect of it, we used to have a, a prison industries prison industries where basically businesses would come in and and uh, they would use that contained kind of a situation with this manpower and they would be getting paid and then therefore getting paid they could pay room and board and this that and the other whatever why can't we do something comparable in the, in the marijuana situation we in this state we own 50 percent of the land why can't we why can't this thing grow it and, and there's a lot of jobs there there's, there's mechanical jobs there's agribusiness aspect of it and well now bruce i, I <laughs> If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to jump on to another issue that I think is right, really right, important. Okay, okay. You mentioned 50% ownership of, of Oregon. Okay, you want to jump on, jump on that? Okay. Uh, now, I don't, I don't rely upon Wikipedia for everything, but I did okay. do a quick search uh, not too long ago. How much of uh, Oregon's surface area is claimed to be owned by the federal government? And what Wikipedia said was 51% of Oregon's land is uh, claimed to be owned by the federal government. That would be the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, there's some uh, the Umatilla uh, Depot, uh, uh, but 51 percent of Oregon is claimed by the federal government. That's absurd, absurd and obscene. But that Both. still is the people. You're the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, right? Well, so we own that stuff. Yeah, but but you can't do what you you, you couldn't go out on Forest Service land and build a house for yourself. So you may claim to own it, but you can't do anything on that land. And it, you know how do you how do you prove you own something? You get to do with it what you want. You can buy it, right, sell right. it, move, you know, remodel it, whatever you want. You can't do that on Forest Service land. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do that on BLM land. Uh, so to say that we own the land is, is a farce. It's, it's it's just not true. What do you suggest we do? Well, I think there's a, there's two things that we could do legitimately. One, uh, the federal government could give all that land to the state of Oregon. Okay. All okay. Right. Alternatively, the federal land, federal government could sell all that land to, to whoever can pay for it. Okay. Either way, if, if they do that, then they're going to reduce the deficit. They're going to or reduce uh, our, our debt. And if they give it to the if, if they give it to Oregon, then Oregon can do with it as it wishes. Now, one of the things you mentioned earlier was school funding. Mm 
-hmm. In a lot of Oregon's rural counties, there has been almost no school funding because yeah. the feds own the timberland. And whereas in days gone by, the feds paid a fee in, in lieu of what, what the counties would get if the timber were being harvested. And they stopped doing that. And a lot of our rural counties have, have gone broke. They can't afford to even have sheriff's deputies uh, because there is no money. And if they can't afford sheriff's deputies, they're not paying for, they're not paying for schools either. It's been a big problem in rural Oregon. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to get the federal government out of Oregon. Is that what Jim going to do once he's elected? Well, I'd certainly vote for every every. Because everybody's going to be you're going to be at that table now. Absolutely representing the federal government. Well, I'd be telling the federal government to stop, you know, get his paws off of Oregon. Okay. Now this came to light. One of the reasons I, I even thought about it was there was that that rancher down in, in uh, Nevada. He caused a great hullabaloo because he he well, they, actually the federal government did take his cattle, uh, and it, but he was, one of the things he bringing out was. Uh, more of Nevada is claimed by the federal government than even Oregon. But it's a, it's a phenomenon that only applies west of the Mississippi. East of the Mississippi, the federal government claims to own almost no land. Hmm. And that's legitimate because the Constitution says that only certain, you can have the, the 10 mile square district, Quen square mile district that is now called the District of Columbia. You can, the federal government can have forts, uh, docks, uh, other needful buildings. Uh, so the Constitution says what the federal government can own in terms of land, and it's not much. It doesn't say anything about the federal federal government claiming to own huge tracts of uh, grazing land or huge tracts of forest land. That's not in the U.S. Constitution. Those are not forts, magazines, or other needful buildings. Hmm. Hmm. Boy, I tell you, you know, it, it still continues, continues to be sort of confusing, if you will. It's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's us. It's the voter. It's the it's the individual. We elect folks to represent us and our ideas. Right. And it's supposed to go up, and they basically talk about how to better our way of life. Fair. All right. Here's another thing. Talk it's, to it me. involves the federal government. Talk to me. We've got federal agencies that are spying on us. They they listen to our phone conversations. They 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 obtain our our email emails. They they're watching us constantly, and that's federal. It's also, to a lesser extent, state and local, but federal. The NSA, CIA, yeah. they have the ability to IRS. collect everything that we, all our communications, IRS. Yeah, oh, we have to tell them our, our secret, our most, you know, our most important secrets. What do we earn? What do we own? We have to tell that to the IRS. And we know that the IRS abuses that. The, there are a lot of Obama officials, and it's not just Obama. Nixon, what, some of the things that they were, they were going to impeach Nixon for was his misuse of the IRS. Yeah, yeah. And what o, the Obama officials have done is far worse in terms of misusing the IRS than, than Nixon did. But they all misuse the IRS because it has so much power. It has so much information. And it has no business having that information. We are the sovereign. Mm -hmm. The people are the sovereign. We don't have a king. That was a, that was a decision we made over 200 years ago. We got him now. We do have a king now. <laughs> we do have, and it's not it's not that Barack Obama is the no, first no, one. No, no, He's no. not. It's, 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 it's just a, it's just a standard kind of procedure. If the if the R's are in, the D's who are working in government works don't work as hard. If the if the uh, D's are in. The, the R's in government don't work as hard for the D's. Mm -hmm. And they open up the books on certain things. Fair? Sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I wish. Well, what can we do to solve this problem? I mean, we, we got a problem. Are they, are they working for the people across the board? Well, here's the thing. We need to go back to being a constitutional republic, which okay. we haven't been for a very, very long okay. time. How do we do that, then? Well, uh, I'm, I'm very pessimistic. I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've got any chance whatsoever of winning this, uh, this election. If if I if I were to win, I, you know, put me on put me on you know watch out I'm gonna I'm gonna have a heart attack, because you know I don't think the people uh, a know the Constitution or b care about the Constitution, and it's, it's really frustrating because every official, whether it be a, a federal official, a state official, a local official, I, I'm I'm a member of the Oregon State Bar. In order to become a member of the Oregon State Bar, I had to take an oath to support and defend the United States Constitution, mm -hmm. which I'm glad to do, and I'm happy to do it. 
But I see lots and lots of other Oregon attorneys who, who don't care, and many, many Oregon attorneys and, and some judges don't even either know or care what the Constitution or Oregon, the Constitution of the United States requires. And we've been acting, uh, our, our officials have been acting as if it, the constitutions don't mean what they say for a very, very, very long time. I mean, you could go back to the establishment of the, the uh, uh, first U.S. bank mm -hmm. uh, under uh, Alexander Hamilton. There's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes Congress to create a bank, and yet we did. Uh, it took uh, uh, Andrew Jackson to get rid of that. And, but we've had the Federal Reserve since 1913, so we're right back to where we were with under Alexander Hamilton. Gee, you want to tell you me. Wow. That's what I would say. I guess the, the thing is that when I look at the candidates that are running you know, for office, in, in some cases your, your, your position, I'm, I, I, I talk with them at times, and uh, they basically have the same ideas you have. But politically speaking, in order to get elected, there's a, there's a certain format they have to follow. Well, the first thing you got to do is you got you to get a lot of money. Yeah, that's, now, that's what I'm saying. I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not asking for any money, and I'm not spending any money. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'm doing now is I'm trying to get 500 signatures so I can get my yeah. voters' pamphlet statement uh, uh, in the voters' pamphlet, but uh, I'm not spending a dime. Now, uh, several years back, one of my opponents, the, the current incumbent, Mr. Merkley, uh, he started his campaign by, by writing on a check for $150 to pay to pull the state of Oregon to, to his filing fee to become a Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate. Uh, uh, I represented a man who was one, one of his opponents, ran for, uh, ran for uh, uh, Senate on the for Republicans. He didn't, he didn't make it. But, uh, but he, he ran again, and, and I also re represented David Brownlow. Mm -hmm. They both uh, ch challenged Merkley's election saying, he, he, he wasn't legitimately uh, elected because he didn't pay his filing fee with gold and silver coin. Mm -hmm. And we ran that all the way up to the, uh, uh, we, we, we went through the court system and we got as far as, we, we, we took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. We got, a, we got one written opinion uh, at the circuit court level. The Court of Appeals affirmed without opinion. The Supreme Court didn't take, the Oregon Supreme Court didn't take it and the U.S. Supreme Court didn't take it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution has never been amended. It says that no state shall make anything other than the payment of gold and silver coin, or payment of silver, gold and silver coin, payment of a debt. Mr. Merkley did not do that six years ago. I'm not I haven't looked in the records, but I guarantee you he didn't do it again this time because mm -hmm. he, got, he got whitewashed. I mean, he, he was not kicked out of office for not, you know, doing it <laughs> properly. Mm -hmm. Now, as a minor party... Uh, uh, candidate, I didn't have to write out a check. I was chosen by the Constitution Party. I didn't have to pay a filing fee. Okay. So I'm That's legal. If, if I'm elected, I will be legally elected. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, hmm. If either Mr. Merkley or the Republican candidate is elected, uh, if they didn't pay with gold and silver coin, and I'm sure they didn't, they will not have been legally elected. And that was in the Constitution? That's in, still in the Constitution. Well, what, what about that legal profession aspect? Of these are the people that are making decisions. Said, so what? Well, exactly. So well, we remember we talked things? about the custodians, right? Okay. Right. What happened when when they, when they they first went to court? The the judges said the statute doesn't mean what it says. Wow. And yeah, I remember that. Yes, it. This is. I mean, it, this is. This happens over and over again. Uh, it, it's very frustrating as, as a member of the bar and as a member who can read the English language. Yes. Uh, the English language is tortured on a regular basis. You know that that school teacher case in, from Medford. If you if you ever read that that court of appeals decision, I think it, it, it's manslaughter of the English language. They they <laughs> they took the statute and said it didn't mean what it said. Gee, gee. Wow, wow. Where do we go from here? Well, folks, as you can see, this is why I'm I'm interviewing Jim, and uh, he's out there. And and in all due respect, what do we do? I mean, you're the voting, you're the voting public, and you know, in, the, in fact, this last this last election. People just didn't get out to vote. A lot of folks just didn't get out to vote. Right. They were just just frustrated aspect of it. And we just basically just trying to make a living. You know. So, so well, as how, I said, how do we get that? We were talking show? about money for just a minute there. Yeah. And and in the, in today's Oregon, in a big article about how the Koch brothers have yeah. dumped a lot of money into a, a big media buy for the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, mm -hmm. and uh, that could well be a game changer. Uh, because uh, you need normally need yeah, money to yeah. get your message out. Right, right. Now, thank goodness for you uh, and a few other uh, the uh, uh, 
Oregon women, women voters are going to have a couple debates. I've agreed to participate. Uh, I hope you, all the candidates participate. There are very, very few opportunities for people who are not spending money to get right. their message exactly. out. Exactly. Uh, but That's we're going to have we're going to have a lot of money poured into the Oregon media, so we're going to be seeing a lot of ads in favor of uh, Ms. We Dr. Weeby. Um, it would be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure that I won't be mentioning any of the ads <laughs> or any of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, well, this media's bonanza, so they, they're not going to say no to the money. We oh, know of that. course not. Okay, okay. then they're going to object to anything that's being said. That's right. Fair? Okay. Yeah. But, 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 but fortunately for us here at PCM, we do represent the community. We represent the voter. And we're sure we've had Dr. Wibby on here, and we want to we wanna basically ask her about some of the same issues that I've, I've talked to you about, and we've talked about that. She seemed to be a very fine person, but again, like I said, it's not, you know, it's not, it, it's driven, if you will, by the monies and the other interest groups, if you will, mm -hmm. and not by the person. It's unfortunate it's, it's, it's that way. But anyway, but we're going to continue on. We're going to have you back on, like anything else. In fact, we'll invite some other folks to come on with you and see whether or not we might get a little debate. Between great. You and others, right? And maybe Merkley, okay? Sounds great. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Jim, it's always a pleasure having you on. Thank you, Bruce. And it's always a pleasure, and, and we wish you well on your campaign. It's very interesting, and uh, I'm sure you're gonna, people know you out there, and they're going to be looking at you and uh, looking at what you're saying, and we're sort of inviting you out there to, again, ask the questions. People are going to be knocking on your doors, and they're going to be sending you material and whatever. Just just talk with them. Ask them, about, ask them for your vote. It still is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We just have to get it back, okay? Jim, thanks again. It's a pleasure. Okay, fine. And as usual, folks, thanks again. Very enjoyable show. We'll see you next week. In fact, we're going to maybe do something on Vic Atia, former Governor Vic Atia. We're gonna, I did one of, one of the last interviews with him. So, hey, enjoy your evening. I'll see you next week. Take care.